Tonight, we are joined by two leading women of Australian history. The first female prime minister and the first female governor general, who both served in office together, the Honorable Julia Gillard AC and the Honorable Dame Quentin Bryce ADCVO. Welcome, Julia and Quentin. It's great pleasure to have you here with us tonight at the National University, even if virtually. The Honorable Julia Gillard AC was sworn in as the 27th Prime Minister of Australia, June 2010, and served in office until June 2013. During her time as Prime Minister, we saw nation-changing reforms to Australian education at every level, from early childhood to higher education, an emissions trading scheme to combat climate change, and the establishment of the nation's first ever national disability scheme, which has helped improve the lives of thousands of Australians living with disabilities every single day. Julia's term in office as Prime Minister was met in some circles, but by behavior that attempted to demean her leadership through what can only be described as misogynistic behavior. Despite this, she continued to be a fierce advocate for female empowerment and consistently demonstrated her true grit and determination in her leadership of the country throughout her entire time in office. She addressed the gender pay gap for social and community workers and addressed Parliament in 2012 with a speech on misogyny that received worldwide attention. And that attention continues today. It's even trending as a TikTok video of 2020. And I think that's the highest praise you can get in 2020 right now, Julia. Julia's legacy extends far beyond her time in Parliament. She continues to advocate for women's rights, education, and mental health. It is an honor to have Julia as part of our ANU community through the establishment of a sister institute to the Global Institute for Women's Leadership, which Julia founded at King's College in London. This institute brings together research, practice, and advocacy to help to continue break down barriers for women by addressing women's underrepresentation in leadership. We are excited to be able to partner with the institute and Julia on this important work. Julia is also the chair for the Australian not-for-profit organization Beyond Blue, chair of the Global Partnership for Education, a patron of the Campaign for Female Education, and was recently announced as the next chair of the UK's Welcome Trust. Now, I've just received my signed copy of Julia's new co-authored book, Women in Leadership, and I'm really looking forward to reading it. It will no doubt be a brilliant uh, read written by two extraordinary individuals. And of course, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. I'd also like to introduce our host for this evening, the Honorable Dame Quentin Bryce. Quentin was sworn in as Australia's 25th Governor General in September 2008. She was the first ever female to serve as Governor General of our nation. In addition to her life in politics, Quentin has enjoyed a distinguished career in academia, law, community, and has been an advocate for human rights and equality. Quentin was appointed an officer of the Order of Australia in 1988, a companion of the Order of Australia in 2003, and in recognition of her contributions to advancing human rights, equality, and the rights of women and children. Following her term served as Governor General, Quentin was appointed Dame of the Order of Australia in March 2014. So thank you very much, Julia and Quentin, for being here tonight. I'd also like to thank Colin Steele, convener and founder of the ANU Meet the Author series, Collins' continued work for 30 years has brought a high caliber of authors to this university over many, many years. And tonight is, of course, no exception and indeed a pinnacle in the uh, long running series. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to hand over to you, Quentin, uh, and let you to it. Thank you. Good evening, my friends. Thank you, uh, Brian, for your kind introduction. I pay my respect to the traditional keepers of this land on the curve of the Brisbane River, the Turrbal and Yagara people. And I acknowledge the inspiring wise Indigenous women who've taught me across my life what it means to be an elder. And uh, Colin Steele, our gratitude to you, uh, as uh, Brian has mentioned, your marvellous work across decades for the Meet the Author series. It's a delight for me, an absolute thrill, to be talking to our former Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, about her latest book, Women and Leadership, Real Lives, Real Lessons. Julia, who could ever have imagined that we'd be meeting like this as COVID-19 
sweeps through humanity. Tough times for our planet and for every single person on it. A time calling out for leadership, leadership to listen to. It has been suggested, I've noted, that women-led nations are doing better in the pandemic. Congratulations to you and to your co-author, Ngozi, on this utterly engaging, energetic exploration, searching for answers to a profound question. Why are there so few national women leaders? In 2020, the number is 13. Julia, I recall our first meeting with Ngozi, then Nigeria's finance minister in Perth in 2011 at Chogham, which you chaired. You'd kindly agreed to my convening a meeting in the margins on empowering women to lead. I recall you on the stage with the three other women Commonwealth heads of government at the end of a long, long day. With that thought in my mind, how does she do it? <laughs> I had the opportunity often to observe the characteristics of your leadership from a unique perspective. And now today, Ngozi chairs Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and you, the Global Partnership for Education, both organisations working for the poorest children in the world. Both of you with a long list of important, influential roles international meetings galore, and often you are at the same ones, becoming friends. Indeed, friendship shines through this book, and that's what particularly uh, appeals to me. It sets the tone, it brings vivacity and authenticity. Personal, warm storytelling, some outrageous humour. But all underpinned, I stress, with the power of the data, academic rigour, sophisticated critical analysis. This is a big, ambitious book. And I want to ask you, how did you actually do it, the two of you together? Well, thank you so much, Quentin, for that lovely introduction. And there is a tremendous symmetry about the two of us being uh, on here now. Uh, not only did you swear me in as Prime Minister, uh, not only were you there when I first met Ngozi, because it was at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting that I first met her, my co-author, but you launched my first book, My Story. So it's tremendous to be back together again, talking about another book. Um, this was a different experience for me when I wrote my story, obviously, um, it was, you know, me focusing on my time in politics and writing from my own memories of that time. Um, this because we worked up the idea together in the margins of international meetings. We would be muttering to each other about what was happening with women leaders around the world and then Hillary lost and we were then really motivated to try and make a difference. So we said, yes, we're going to write a book. And then we settled on the foundation stones that you see in this book. We wanted it to bring the psychological and gender research, and we wanted it to bring women leaders stories and to put the two together and particularly to say, does the research hold true in the real world? And we then worked from there to a comprehensive concept note and we adopted this structure of hypotheses that we wanted to draw from the research and then get our women leaders to respond to. So the uh, structure of the book that you see uh, has been with us for a long time. Then we had to canter around the world and do the interviews, and that took the longest time uh, because the women leaders we were uh, meeting were incredibly busy. We were busy, so to find the times when the stars all, all aligned was quite difficult. When it came to the writing process, we agreed, because you can only really have one master copy, that I would hold the pen um, and hold the master copy and I would go back and forth with Ngozi and she would write sections and then I would incorporate them. Then we would both go through bits and edit using the track changes function that everybody's probably frustratingly all too familiar with. And we just 
worked like that. So a lot of time speaking to each other, some time working directly together, but a lot of it done virtually and online. So if anything, we were getting ready for the COVID era uh, by spending so much time collaborating in that manner. And then it all came together in the you know months of lockdown uh, where uh, she's been in Washington, I've been in Adelaide and we did the final polishing and the book is there for everybody now. Mm -hmm. I uh, must say, I'm impressed by the way you introduced the uh, eight women leaders. Some of them are better known uh, than others uh, to us here in Australia. But uh, certainly, candour is their hallmark in describing their pathways to power and explaining the world through uh, their eyes. And uh, one can only be deeply struck by the, the courage, the risks, the violence the sacrifices, the horrific abuse uh, coming through many of the stories, things we couldn't imagine, the imprisonment, terms in jail, poverty. But in the midst of these uh, vicissitudes, service, selflessness, determination in spades, and ideas, passion for progressive change. So uh, how did you and Ngozi uh, choose the leaders? Well, actually, the first choice we needed to make was, uh, were we going to focus on political leaders or were we going to approach women leaders more broadly? And we debated that back and forth and decided to focus on political leaders. Uh, one, because there's only so much you can do in a book. And uh, we knew that around about eight leaders was probably the maximum number where you could tell the tales and uh, work, work it through with the research in the way that we wanted to. So we talked about it and decided we would focus on political leaders, not because we wanted the book only to be about political leadership, but we thought the spotlight on women is at its brightest, its hottest, its harshest when it comes to the public stage that is politics and when the people you ultimately have to interact with is the mass of the community with voters. So we made that decision. And then we knew we wanted this to be a truly global book. And so that meant we were looking for leaders around the world. And Ngozi, of course, coming from Nigeria, was very keen that Africa be strongly represented. And so that then, you know, find us down again. And we said, well, let's look at a number of serving women leaders. Let's look at some who have um, ended their political careers. And then we added um, to, you know, we've got presidents and prime ministers, but in our look at political leadership, we couldn't walk past Hillary Clinton, given her campaign experience, I think, is the thing that so many women around the world have been uh, disheartened by and motivated by all at the same time. I mean, millions of women rallied around the world after she lost the 2016 election. And we wanted uh, to also have someone who could speak from being at international meetings and focusing on the economy. And so we approached Christine Lagarde from the IMF. And that what gives that's what gives you the class of women in the book, um, you know, from Norway to the UK to New Zealand to Liberia, Malawi, Chile, uh, Hillary, Christine, uh, it is there for people to see. And I do hope that one of the delights of this book for people in Australia is it enables them to hear the stories of women that we're less familiar with because their countries just aren't routinely in our news cycle. So we don't get to learn about them the way we might know, for example, about Jacinda Ardern or Theresa May. Mm. And, of course, uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf's come into uh, focus recently too with the inquiry she's doing. Uh, yes, she has. So she yeah. and Helen Clark are undertaking the inquiry for the WHO into the virus and uh, two fantastic and formidable women to do it. <laughs> um, what about uh, the striking qualities you observe them to uh, have in common? Well, we, looking across all of these women, obviously they've achieved, they've um, been genuine leaders uh, and we knew that that experience would bring insights. Uh, beyond that, 
we also wanted to have a variety of perspectives. So these are not women from one side of the party political divide. Uh, there are conservative women, progressive women, uh, countries where the political spectrum and the issues that are to the forefront uh, don't necessarily fit with our conceptions in Australia about um, you know, the right and the left. It's issues beyond that. For example, Liberia emerging from civil war. Um, so we, we looked for that diversity, but we also looked for women who have been prepared to talk about gender. And that does vary across the group. Some of these women have been very forward leaning on talking about their experiences as women leaders. Uh, I'm thinking here, for example, of Michelle Bachelet, who in between her two periods of being president of Chile, uh, served as the first ever leader of UN women. Um, but uh, we also want to include women who didn't necessarily foreground it all that way, but who had made a contribution to the debate. So Theresa May had set up before she was prime minister, a conservative party organisation called Women to Win. So each of them we thought uh, would have spent a lot of time considering gender issues and therefore the insights would be personal experience but also a deeper analysis. I thought at, uh, at a more uh, personal level there was across the, the group a sense of uh, uh, secure childhood's encouragement uh, at, at an early age uh, in their environments uh, um, too. I kept asking myself uh, uh, about about those uh, questions of uh, you know what what were the uh, qualities that uh, that that motivate them and drove them because they were certainly all very brave, courageous uh, pioneers. Yeah. They, they certainly were. And, and you know, the first uh, sort of hypothesis we drill into is whether there is something in family background that helps build a female leader. And even though life was so very different for each of them, um, all of them said that they grew up in families where they were taught... Uh, to aim high. None of them was hothouse. None of them was, you know, told the, you know, the family will think you're a failure unless you end up being a president or a prime minister. Uh, it wasn't that experience, but it was an experience where no one told them no. No one said to them, either their mother nor their father said to them, oh, you know, those jobs, they're for the boys, those leadership positions, that's what boys do, mm -hmm. or that won't be your life. Mm -hmm. um, they were never told that. So there was something enabling about the environment. Mm -hmm. But whilst it was enabling in that psychological sense, um, many of them came from the, the deepest of poverty. Um, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf's father in Liberia was an Indigenous uh, leader, but he died uh, when she was quite young and her family was thrown into poverty. Joyce Bander comes from a poorer country and a poorer background. Michelle Bachelet's father was a general and was one of the elite of her country. But then, of course, there was the military dictatorship and the overthrow. He was imprisoned and tortured to death. Um, so these women many of them overcame unbelievable obstacles to end up where they are and uh, with the leadership experiences that they've got to share. Yes, I, I remember uh, with great affection uh, Michelle Bachelet staying with us during her visit to Australia at uh, Yarralumla and uh, I hosted an official lunch for her and I managed to uh, find uh, Mavis Robertson, whom you might remember, uh, Michelle stayed with that family when uh, Michelle and her family came to Australia during the Pinochet time. Uh, yeah. So there was a lovely uh, reunion. Uh, but uh, I was struck by the way, as all of these women uh, show uh, through their actions, more than their words, how how committed and dedicated and hardworking they were to what they were doing. Uh, that, uh, you know, getting to know some of them and uh, especially having them in what was then our home, uh, observing how, how hard they worked, you know, that uh, uh, they weren't uh, uh, sitting around, uh, you know, after dinner in the evening. It was 
upstairs. They uh, seldom had uh, uh, many people there to support them. But, you know, into, into the work, uh, I, I was uh, very uh, taken by that, really. Mm. It, it's a theme across uh, what the women say that um, one one of the strategies that they uh, had to employ um, in order to be seen as good as the men. You know, these women faced off doubters, people who thought that they couldn't do it. And because they knew that there was that doubt, it seemed to have bred in each of them an incredible work ethic mm. and always wanting to be on top of the brief, always being the one who can, uh, you know, present and, and command the information because they know that there are some people who are looking for that slightest crack of doubt, you know, oh, I knew, I knew she wasn't up to it. She's made a mistake. She's got that wrong. And it's an incredible differential pressure, really, that, you know, you don't get um, uh, much forgiveness uh, if there are mistakes. And we do uh, structure a whole chapter around that as a hypothesis, whether uh, women pay a greater price for errors because women are still unusual in leadership. And so if they fail, that is seen as a comment, not just on them as an individual, but on all women. And so they have that additional frame around them as people look at what they're doing um, and judge its worth. I uh, love the uh, testing of the uh, hypotheses, uh, eight of them. There seems to be a, a bit of a theme of eight in the structure of this book. I don't know what that means. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, there's this generosity of spirit, really, that uh, flows through the conversations. Not to say that they're not uh, robust and uh, 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 wise, uh, uh, very uh, much uh, the personal uh, the, and as well as the, uh, the political, of course. Loads of uh, practical good advice, all learnt the hard way. But uh, I, I must say the titles really resonate of those hypotheses that you tested, of course, with the, with the evidence. Uh, and as you've commented many times, it's rather difficult to do in many cases because there's only very small studies that you can do because of the uh, paucity of numbers. But, you know, the, the you go girl. And I think that that's uh, a theme that you are uh, uh, very into uh, now and that your, your message and, and, and that comes through uh, all of the leaders really about encouraging and supporting young women's hopes and aspirations for political office, but making sure that they're making informed choices, that they're prepared and not just to go on, you can do it, uh, you know, and a push between the shoulder blades, but much more than that, the, the uh, uh, wisdom of, of lived experience. That That's right. I mean, we want people, um, I mean, we want people from uh, different walks of life and different um, uh, pathways as to what they want to do in the future to read the book. But we certainly want uh, women who are aspiring to leadership, whether that's political leadership, corporate leadership, university leadership, you know, uh, civil society leadership. We want them to, uh, you know, have, have the book as a resource. And it, it would have been insulting people's intelligence if we just said, you know, you go for it. You want to be a leader, you know, all to the good, off you go. Um, because women know, everyone knows that there's still a gendered bit. There's still going to be days when the treatment of that woman will be lesser and different simply because she's a woman. And so we want the book to stand for the proposition, you go for it, but go for it forewarned and forearmed, knowing uh, that there will be uh, times when you face this different treatment. And perhaps, you know, we want you to take the space to think in advance what your strategies will be when that moment comes, rather than being blindsided, which many women, um, you know, who step into leadership then feel quite um, taken aback, mugged when uh, that gendered moment does happen. Uh, we, we want it to be a rallying cry, though, for more than women who are aspiring. Uh, we want it to be 
uh, a book that gives strategies to everyone to make a difference in the world and make a difference for women and leadership. Uh, and so, you know, whether it's just the simple task of making sure that uh, everyone in a group gets to speak and it's not the men who take all of the airtime, the women get some of the airtime, through to people who have power using that power to make a difference for uh, women, uh, we're urging everyone to do that and we're putting some suggestions. In, we have put some suggestions in the book as to how that can be done. Um, on, you know, what difference it ultimately makes for girls, uh, we do uh, talk about a study in India in the book that shows very clearly that villages that ended up led by women, uh, the next generation of girls, not only was inspired by the role modelling effect, but it had a practical impact in the here and now. Girls in those villages studied harder and did better at school because they knew that there was this potential pathway forward for them. So there is a virtuous circle here if we can... Uh, mobilise to get more women leaders, then we will make it easier for the next generation and the generation after that. And I know that's something uh, you've thought about across your life and made a huge difference to through your own work and something that I've been very focused on since leaving politics. I do want it to be easier for the next woman. I uh, must say it's something I enjoy more and more as I get older and I see it as a responsibility for us who are who are elders now to uh, uh, give that uh, nourishment and encouragement. You talk uh, quite a lot about uh, uh, the sponsoring and uh, mentoring and, uh, uh, but uh, you know, there's the very practical uh, issue that's raised about how much time that takes for leaders themselves and how often when you're in a top leadership role, particularly in politics, you're asked to fulfil those roles, but, you know, how, how incredibly time-consuming they are. But also, I think there's some really interesting discussion about the, the uh, power and the effects of different approaches and a conclusion that comes back to, really, the strength of networking itself. Uh, but I, uh, I, I loved some of the uh, uh, hypotheses, I must say, uh, you know, it's all about the hair and women's appearances and those jokes we've all been having with each other forever. I remember when I was uh, uh, sworn in as governor of Queensland, the uh, uh, picture on the front page of the newspaper was my sort of dismembered ankle and foot, really, to show my green shoes I was wearing, you know. <laughs> so many things we can laugh about. But, uh, you know, it's... it's uh, uh, fascinating to uh, see the way uh, Hillary uh, analyzes all that and uh, talks about the time uh, that it took her during her campaign to have uh, her appearance, you know, up to scratch with the uh, uh, the hair and the makeup and the, the blah blah. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, we, we take the, the, uh, that hypothesis about appearance. We uh, really took the chapter title, It's All About the Hair, uh, from a statement that Hillary made because she joked that the book she wrote about her time as Secretary of State, uh, where she had visited more than 100 countries representing the US. You couldn't have a more intense or important job, really, than the one she was doing in the Obama administration, other than being a president yourself. Um, and she said she thought she should call that uh, 112 countries and it's still all about the hair, the scrunchy chronicles, uh, because so much of the coverage of her trips around the world was about how she took to pulling her hair back in a ponytail with a, you know, scrunchy uh, fabric covered el elastic band, uh, because, you know, that was the only way uh, she could uh, manage it with the intensity of the work. So, yes, these appearance questions are different for women. Uh, we talk about who's minding the kids uh, because family structures are much more inquired into for women leaders and we talk uh, you know um, perhaps a bit controversially we have a chapter entitled she's a bit of a bitch and another one called shrill or soft the style conundrum where we're trying to get to um, the way in which women have to weave strength and empathy um, because if they appear 
too strong, too power seeking, too ambitious, uh, the research absolutely shows that that gets a negative reaction and people mm. conclude that the woman is unlikable. And some of that sex stereotyping and sexism is very, very deep seated. And we've been talking about it, having campaigns about it uh, for decades and decades now, but it's, uh, it's uh, still there and it can be a very powerful turn off for a lot of aspiring young women leaders, I think. I think that's right. And I think um, uh, Brian made a, a reference to, uh, you know, the TikTok use of the misogyny video, but that, um, uh, you know, started uh, with a, a woman who's uh, lip syncing to the misogyny uh, speech, uh, but the, uh, the soundtrack she's got in the background um, is a, a song that uh, says literally, I'm a bitch, I'm a boss, because... Um, uh, and says it in an empowering way, you know, women owning that, I'm a bitch, I'm a boss. But it just that people would write those lyrics shows that young women are onto this, that they uh, know that, that there's that stereotype waiting for them and they're almost going to debunk it and diffuse it through owning it and through humour uh, before it tries to come and get them. Oh, I think it's fantastic. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I must say, I like uh, Christine Lagarde when she talks about being a weeper, she says, uh, when uh, it, I think that's on the, uh, uh, the shrill or soft uh, conundrum. And uh, she says, I'm a weeper. I never put mascara on my bottom lashes so I can cry and don't look as though I've got a hangover. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's got, there's some great quotes from uh, Christine Lagarde and uh, especially the fighting word she says when people reject me or are dismissive of me because I'm a woman I say sod off I'm not working with you if you don't like me because I'm a woman or you won't work in partnership with me because I'm a woman I'm off I'll find better <laughs> <laughs> and I think that you know they, 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 in this humour that, that comes through, it does break up a lot of the tension uh, that is underlying many of these deeply personal stories. Some of them are uh, very intense. Some of them are very intense. Uh, you know, both Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who was the yeah. first woman to lead a nation in Africa, leading Liberia, and Joyce Bander, who was the second, leading Malawi, uh, both of them had violent first marriages that they needed to escape um, and, well, endure, live through, and then escape uh, in order to get on with their lives. And they took uh, that personal experience with violence um, into their lead and deliberately worked as leaders to try and make uh, it easier for women to get out of uh, unsafe situations. So, you know, when you hear about stories like that and their preparedness to be so frank and so honest about those mm. circumstances, um, and it, it, it's sort of awe-inspiring, but the fact that both of them still pre present to the world with so much good humour and so much mm. generosity mm. Uh, about sharing what they've learned and about inspiring the next generation, that really struck, struck me as we worked with them. I think they have inspired the next generation and the next. I was very impressed during my uh, visits to African countries by wonderful emerging young women leaders and when I came back to Australia I explored engaging in that uh, in uh, our country uh, here too and as, as uh, uh, you said before uh, how generous these women are sharing the stories the way they do uh, with a searing honesty uh, and this vital candour. Uh, a lot of women leaders don't do that and historically haven't done it, particularly women first, uh, an exception being Madeleine Albright, who's famous for her line, you know, where there's a special place in hell for women who don't support other women. And that's one of the uh, uh, issues that you uh, explore in the uh, hypotheses list. What have been your experiences with that? 
I had fantastic support from female colleagues within the Labor Party. I mean, undoubtedly a very strong support when I was a Prime Minister, you know, personally, uh, they would um, see the gendered treatment. They would, uh, you know, want to be supportive. Uh, you know, Tanya, Nicola, Jenny, uh, Penny, so many of the women closest to me made a, a huge difference. I think in politics, it gets harder across the party lines. Um, you know, there's so much partisanship uh, that it can be difficult for women to reach out to other women across the political lines. And I also think that there's um, pressure put on journalists and others who commentate about politics. And indeed, Theresa May um, offers this observation about her time as Prime Minister, that she thought some women journalists gave her a harder time. But she thinks that happened because, you know, back at the office, uh, people were saying to them, uh, you know, oh, you're going to go and interview the Prime Minister. I bet you go easy on her. You know, so they're expecting or even kind of... Um, chiding or niggling that uh, there'll be this sisterhood that means uh, that, you know, the interview is a puff piece. And so that results in the, the woman journalist going even stronger than she would have if she was interviewing a man. So there are kind of curious dimensions to this that are worth talking about and thinking through. I mean, the point we make in the book very strongly is um, there's a scarcity politics that's kind of been um, shaping of women's behaviour. You know, we uh, for a long time, there were no seats at the table for women, and then a few seats became available, a couple of seats on a corporate board, a couple of the seats around a cabinet table. And the uh, reaction of women, um, if you're not careful, it's pretty easy to say, well, there's only two seats that are going to go to women. So my competitors are the other women looking for those seats. Uh, you know, that the politics of scarcity then implants a set of behaviours in us where we compete with each other rather than cooperate with each other. Whereas really what we should be doing is working together to say, these aren't the rules of the game. You know, if there's 10 seats around that table, then half of them should be going to women and we're in competition with everyone who seeks those seats, women and men, uh, not just the other women. And so we ask in that uh, chapter where we talk about the politics of scarcity and whether uh, any of us are going to that special place in hell that Madeleine Albright speaks about, uh, about uh, trying to work together to get around this artificial uh, butting of heads that can go on between women. I thought the way that issue was discussed was uh, very revealing. And I noticed that there, and quite often through uh, addressing uh, some of these hypotheses, that uh, the word fair is used. You know, when, when you're addressing a, a, a dilemma, uh, that that's what you can call on for some guidance for yourself when you're asking about some of those issues. Uh, it, it struck me how strongly fairness was uh, uh, there on, on the agenda, uh, in, particularly in the, the uh, advice, the standout advices that are there at the end of the book that I think are very powerful and practical and uh, terrific for, for all, uh, all readers. Uh, now, we're coming up to some Q&A time, I think, but um, I uh, wanted to ask you uh, uh, one thing before we go to that. Uh, you say in the first chapter, Julia, that despite your long experience that you're still working out many things, uh, many issues that are surrounding women and leadership in 2020. And... Uh, Another thing you say at the outset of this book is that you feel you're better equipped uh, now to be an advocate for women's leadership than when you were the Prime Minister. Could, could you expand on those thoughts? Uh, yes, I, I keep learning things. I mean, I... Uh, you know, one of the delights of being involved with the Global Institute for Women's Leadership, and I'm so looking forward to it being at the Australian National University too, is that the research, 
the evidence keeps developing, we learn more. Uh, but a lot of that is, uh, you know, powered by young minds, by young women who see issues differently. And the fact that I get exposed to their new and innovative thinking means I, I go back to some of the assumptions that I've carried with me all of my life and start holding them up to the light and thinking, was I right about that? So, um, you know, there's, there's uh, always challenges in it. You know, one decision I made very early on in life was there was, uh, you know, the pathway I took was a pathway of uh, being involved in institutions and trying to bring a feminist agenda to that involvement. Uh, other women took a pathway of being involved in women's organisations. Uh, and, you know, I think I, for me, made the right choice, but I... I'm increasingly uh, questioning where the, the the dynamic is between the two. I would have said uh, unambiguously for a lot of my life that uh, you know being being in the room where it happens, to quote a bit of Hamilton, uh, is is where women need to be. And I still believe that, but I'm far more uh, thinking and open now about the power of women's advocacy as women's advocacy from the outside and the extra space that that can make for uh, more and better decisions to be made in the room where it happens. So that dynamic between the two feminist strategies that people have uh, talked about over years. Um, so uh, I'm learning more. I think I'm a better advocate now um, because I've had the time to uh, just immerse myself in the analysis of women and leadership rather than live it. And so I can bring the lived experience, took all of my attention, running the country's a big, big job. Uh, you don't have the time to go home and read the latest um, uh, instalment of uh, evidence and research, the right, latest uh, feminist tract, you know, you just don't. Um, I have more time to do that now but I can bring to that reading a seasoned eye because I've lived through it. So to marry now that experience and that analysis, I, I feel I can do that in my own head. And what I wanted to do in the book, working with Ngozi, is bring the power of doing that through a number of women's voices, not just my own. I uh, just, uh, conclude this part of the evening by pointing out at the outset, I think one of your very first sentences is, I've always been a feminist. And Ngozi describes herself as a womanist. Yes. Uh, why? And it's a, a very charming, warm piece of writing. Uh, the, uh, the book is filled with that. I, I love the, the, the flowing conversations, uh, the, the, uh, the candor. Uh, that's the richness of the book. It, it, it is about uh, women and leadership through the eyes and the experiences of eight extraordinary international women. So uh, thank you for it and congratulations on your leadership and negotiations in this book. Oh, thank you, Quentin. What you're thank doing you. for our uh, daughters and our granddaughters. And uh, so now I've got some uh, questions here. And the first one is on behalf of Alex. As a 23-year-old male, what can I be doing to ensure equal rights for women? Well, uh, I think uh, Alex can be doing a lot and men can be doing a lot. Uh, we, uh, in the book, talk about uh, a piece of research uh, about meetings. And so they've analysed the dynamics in meetings of five people. And it isn't until you get to the stage that four of those five people are women that women will get a fair share of the conversation time. If you've got two or more men in the group, then women won't get a fair share of the discussion. And that's a very powerful piece of research. And it means all of us, you know, uh, uh, Alex, all of us uh, in meetings can make sure that women's voices are coming to the table and women's voices are heard. So very practical piece of advice. Uh, second, the research shows that if a man points out sexism, that people are more likely to agree that the incident was sexist. 
Um, so if a woman calls out sexism, I guess people in their heads think to themselves, well, you know, that she's kind of inherently conflicted because she might be benefiting from pointing out that sexism. So she's got mixed motivations. But if a man does it, it's just accepted in its own terms. And then amazingly, um, the research shows that if a man points to sexism um, and is prepared to call out inequality, that people believe him to have better leadership capacity and men are more likely to advance in their careers as a result of having done so, uh, because he's seen to be the sort of person uh, who will look after others. So with all of that, like it's all upside here. It's tremendously all upside uh, for men to be advocates of women's rights. So get right in there uh, and be prepared to use your voice and your power for change. Now, from uh, uh, Sonia, uh, what advice would you give to young women who are just starting their professional careers after leaving university who are confronted by issues similar to your time in Parliament? In, in the book, we uh, give a, a number of lessons, so I can't go through them all, but I would say the standout ones in those circumstances would be to... Um, Think about whether you as the individual feel you've got the power and the voice and the resilience to be the person who raises the problems with that treatment. And if it's your first job out of university, you may not, you may not. Uh, and that would be understandable. If you don't want to raise it yourself, then think about the strategies that might bring women together to raise it collectively or might get male allies on board who would raise it for you. This shouldn't be something that you think it's landing on my shoulders and unless I do something about it, then nothing can be done. Um, the, the networking, the bringing of people together, I think can make a powerful difference. Um, so, uh, we, we talk in the book about how to engage others in these conversations in a way that might be a bit less, um, you know, confronting and uh, ways of uh, trying to unpack issues so that you do get change. There's never going to be one right way. I mean, one thing people have said to me in the wake of the misogyny speech is, you know, you called it out, we should all be calling it out. Well, you know, I was Prime Minister of the country in question time in a combative adversarial environment and I use my skills and my voice um, with the misogyny speech. Not everybody is in a comparable position. There's not just one way of calling sexism out and working with and through others is certainly a productive strategy too. I think with uh, TikTok now, there's a lot of girls practicing probably. <laughs> I think they are. <laughs> now uh, from uh, the next question, a COVID 19 has exposed the failings of many global leaders, particularly men. Are men in leadership positions able to get away with mistakes that would be career ending for women? I, I think women do pay a greater price for errors. And uh, one of the reasons I think that is um, we, uh, in the book, looked at the experience of a woman we didn't interview, but Dilma Rousseff, the former president of Brazil who was impeached. Um, and we explored the question whether uh, a male politician who had made some of the same decisions decisions and errors as Dilma, because she certainly made some, uh, whether they too would have been impeached. And, you know, people, reasonable people can differ on this, and we explore that in the book. But it's, it's in her experience, the abuse of her became gendered. She had fewer roots in her political party and political movement. She was not on the boys' network, which could have provided a man with more political protection. And there was also this sense that, you know, kind of showing you that a woman couldn't do it. You know, she was the first woman to lead Brazil, kind of showing you that a woman wasn't up to the task. Whereas when men make errors, I think they're more likely just to be judged in their own terms. So, you know, people aren't going to say... Um, uh, if a man makes an error, that that is a reflection generally on the whole c class and capability of men to lead, they will say he's made an error, not men are ill-adapted for leadership. So that is an extra burden on women's shoulders. 
in this COVID era, we are having a lively discussion about, you know, male and female leadership mm. styles. I'm always a bit careful about those discussions because um, I think we're almost baking the stereotyping in. We're saying, you know, female leadership must be, must be empathetic. Male leadership can be command and control. In a truly equal world, uh, we could have a command and control style female leader and an incredibly empathetic male leader. You know, these things ought to be possible. We shouldn't bake the stereotyping in. But I do think you can conclude that this is a bad era for that um, strong man blustering, swaggering, macho kind of approach, you know, um, I, I'll do what I want, I'll say what I want, I'll think what I want, I won't listen to the experts. Um, and going back to Brazil, um, you know, the cur cur current president there, President Bolsonaro, I think is probably the most uh, clear global example of that at the moment and actually has the virus himself. Mm -hmm. Now, from Judy Schneider, Julia, do you think that the media environment in Australia has changed since you were PM? Has it become more or less supportive of women politicians? I think uh, there is a um, clearer discussion about gender and politics now, and there's a greater price to be paid uh, by journalists who, um, you know, do write something sexist. I mean, when I was um, PM back in, you know, uh, 10 years ago, as it is now, 10 years ago, when uh, you swore me in as Prime Minister, we had the anniversary a few short weeks ago, um, you know, social media was a thing, but it certainly wasn't at the stage that it is now. Uh, the media environment was diversifying because of uh, new media styles, but it wasn't as diver diversified as it is now. Um, and there wasn't the online activism that would take to task uh, gendered reporting. There is much more of that now. So I think all of that means that this is a better environment and that's all to the good. But it's certainly nowhere near good enough because even with that increased diversity, we still have a very concentrated media market. Our media overwhelmingly is in, um, you know, uh, one company, one set of hands uh, in the Murdoch media. Um, and we still have uh, gendered reporting about women that uh, endures. It's not like the online activism has got it all out of the system. So um, I would say on this travelling in the right direction, but still a very big road in front of us. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Amanda from Canberra. Julia, what was your most surprising takeaway from interviewing such a broad spectrum of female leaders? I think the most surprising takeaway, and Ngozi and I talked about this and talked about it and talked about it, we, in interviewing such a global and diverse group, we wanted to know how much is common for women everywhere and how much is context specific and culture specific. And we went back and forth about that. And doing the interviews, it became increasingly clear that while there are things that are clearly culture and context specific, actually the nature of sexism is pretty universal and that many of the issues these uh, our women leaders faced were the same, whether you were um, you know, dealing with uh, Liberia emerging from civil war or whether you were the second female prime minister of the United Kingdom. You're reminding me of the power of the bonds I saw uh, amongst women around the world when I was uh, travelling representing our country overseas. I used to have a meeting, women's meeting, uh, the, the first item on my agenda wherever I travelled because I knew that that was how I would find out the things I really wanted to know before I got going. And the, the, the power of those bonds wherever we were, whatever the backgrounds were through all sorts of differences, what might be seen by some as barriers, the, the universal themes that were so powerful, the bonds that women share through our care for our children and our grandchildren for the future, 
Uh, and it, it reminds me, as you speak the way you are, in answer to that question of, of, of that universality too. Yes, uh, now, yes. It's not like it's not like um, you couldn't start the conversation because yeah. while so much would you know you growing up in uh, in Queensland and you're meeting women from all around the world who have grown up in different circumstances, but uh, there are some things that have happened to you that have happened to them that can mm -hmm. be that touching point, and then mm -hmm. you can take the discussion from there. And you can communicate across all what be, might be seen as barriers very easily once you get going and how much women welcome that interchange, so that coming together and uh, that's, that shines through this book too, I think, in those, the conversations from the uh, eight uh, women. Uh, now, last question, how have the leaders uh, discussed maintained their authenticity under such pressure from Jackie Crispin Brown? Yeah, I mean, we uh, use that uh, word authenticity and we got different reactions to it by uh, women leaders. I mean, Hillary Clinton, um, uh, for example, thought that, um, you know, the use of the word authentic is often a word used to uh, debunk and deride women leaders, that it becomes easy to say about a female politician, oh, she's not very authentic, and it's just another way of saying she's not right for the job. Uh, whereas um, others uh, thought that, you know, uh, speaking in their, uh, being not only speaking in their own voice, but being seen to speak in their own voice was actually absolutely pivotal to their leadership. And Jacinda Ardern, for example, you know, was, was very clear, and she talks about this in the book, that she made a decision early on that, um, you know, she's the kind of person who wanted empathy and kindness to be at the centre of her leadership. And if that meant that she didn't actually go very far in politics, it, that was her true voice. And if that true voice didn't take her very far, then that was a price she was pre prepared to pay. Um, so I, I think that means that there's more than one way of looking at this issue of authenticity. I think all of the women that we spoke to would say that they tried to lead in a way that was authentic to themselves, but each of them felt the pressure of gender stereotyping and they did have that second voice in their heads about how is this going to be received? And, and Jacinda says that too. Mm. Um, they didn't try and let that voice overwhelm them, but the fact that they have to have that second voice in their heads is an indication that we still have to get rid of uh, this stereotyping or we're forcing women to walk a very narrow pathway as to how they can present their leadership rather than, you know, discarding the second voice in their head, just being themselves and not having to worry about how the gender prism is going to uh, view uh, the way that they act. You know, Jacinda actually talks about, you know, it should be possible for uh, a woman who is um, ambition, ambitious, strident, strong um, to be a leader and for no one to react to that on the basis of, oh, she's not very nice, she's not very likeable, she doesn't seem very caring, uh, because why shouldn't that be a leadership style that a woman can take uh, in the same way that empathy can be a leadership style a woman can take? Um, we need women to be able to be right across the leadership spectrum, not confined to one bit of it. She also talks about the benefit she has of being the third woman prime minister as opposed to the first. And I think there's only two countries that have had a third woman prime minister, New Zealand and Iceland. That's right. Oh no, Jacinda is incredibly clear that uh, being the third um, has uh, not, not rendered the gender uh, reception of her leadership to zero, but it's lessened it. You know, and she says in terms of her own decision making about going into politics, she, she never had a question in her head can a woman do this? That wasn't the question. She knew women could do it. She'd worked with Helen Clark. She'd seen Helen do it for a decade. She knew women could do it. She had a question in her head about whether she could do it and she wanted to do it. Uh, but the you know influence of Helen and Jenny Shipley meant it was already priced in by her and the New Zealand community that a woman could lead. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I think that comes to the uh, conclusion of our conversation and uh, I want to say to you how much I've enjoyed it uh, uh, and uh, best of luck to you uh, travelling and uh, talking about the book. Thank you, Quentin. It's uh, not going to be too much travelling in, in this uh, COVID era, uh, many, many of these online conversations, but I'm so glad that we got the opportunity uh, after the wonderful way you launched my first book, uh, that we had the opportunity to have this discussion about uh, women and leadership. Thank you. And thank you, Julia. Well, thank you both. And can I just say how good uh, was that? Because one of the weird things about COVID-19 and us being able to do these virtual events is rather than being in a big stadium or large lecture theater, uh, we literally have you in our rooms, our, our houses having a conversation. And it's, it's, it's remarkably uh, uh, intimate. Uh, and uh, it's just been a, a, a fantastic conversation this evening. Uh, I really appreciate how we have been able to, I learn, I think of some of the common threads across the very diverse backgrounds uh, that are uh, of female leadership that are in this book. And I really appreciate the worth that, worth, work ethic observation that you made, uh, Julia, because my experience is that female leaders work so hard all the time and really do try to make sure they don't make mistakes ever in a way that their male counterparts never have to do. Uh, somewhat saddened that forewarned and forearmed is still the motto in 2020. Having leaders like the two of you, I think are really important because it normalizes female leadership. So each generation finds it easier. But I think, unfortunately, uh, our young women still do need to be forewarned and forearmed. I hope future generations find that less so. And men, as Julia said, it's all upside to be a feminist. So to my male <laughs> colleagues, we'll see. Uh, Julia, your book clearly weaves together personal narratives, humor, and data around a diverse set of amazing leaders. And I think this work will help us all understand the nature of the things that women in leadership positions face. And just as first know the nature of things is the ANU's motto, uh, I just know from my experience, from understanding, like you are providing, all good things flow. Uh, so finally, I wanna thank you, Quentin, for leading our conversation tonight. And thank you, Julia, for being prepared to shine a light on female leadership, the good and the bad, so that we can all have better leaders in the future. So we can't give you a round of applause, <laughs> but we'll a virtual round of applause. Let's thank Julia Gillard, Quentin Bryce, if only in our hearts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.